us. This is a study on how we can win others to Christ. To win others to Christ, you need to carry the correct equipment. And that's what this uh, little study is about. This chapter 4 is the outline is you have a prayer list, you have a pocket testament, have tracts about salvation. We're going to study that. We're going to try to knock those three out tonight. But looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 18. Paul writes, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. He says, I want it free to everybody. I want everybody to be able to receive Jesus Christ, have the gospel message. Verse 19, for though I be free from all men, meaning he don't owe anybody anything, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. He said, I don't owe anybody anything. Nobody, nobody owns me. I can do whatever I want to do, but I will do whatever I can do to win people to Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Verse 20, And unto the Jews I become as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law as without law, that would be Gentiles, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. He says, I'm not lawless. What he's saying there in verse 21, he's saying, he's saying I'm not lawless. It's, uh, without the law, the Ten Commandments, the, the Mosaic law, I'm without that law. But I'm not lawless. I'm under the law of Jesus Christ, which is to love your neighbor, love your enemies. We know the law of Christ. That I might gain them that are without the law. Verse 22, to the weak become I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. The Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to this study, Father, we got to thank you so much for uh, things you've been doing for us, Lord God, in prayer, Lord. We thank you for your healing hand, Lord God. And Father, you know where our heart is tonight, Lord God, our hearts with our loved ones, Lord God. And I pray, Father, for your healing hand to continue, Lord. I pray for the doctors to have wisdom. Lord, and I do thank you for the wisdom you give the doctors and nurses, Lord God. And Father, you know our heart, Lord, what we want. And Father, we want some healing, Lord. And you have been doing that. And you've been showing some wonderful things, Lord. And we give you all the honor and glory. But Lord, as we come in here tonight, Lord God, we want to glorify you. We want to learn more about you, Lord Jesus. And we pray your Holy Spirit will move among us, helping us to learn, Lord, how we can lead others to you what we can do, what equipment we can use, Lord God, what we need to do and how we can do it better, Lord. And pray, Father, for some learning, Lord God. And I pray a blessing on these people that came out here tonight, Lord God. A lot of them have worked all day long, Lord, and traveled on the roads, the highways and the byways, Lord. I pray, Father, you bless them, Lord. Write them in your book of remembrance. In Jesus Christ, holy name I pray. Amen. All right, so what Paul is saying there in verse 22, he says, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. What we're trying to learn about winning others to Christ is you've got to do whatever it takes. You need to do whatever it takes to win somebody to Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's basically saying. He goes, I'll do whatever it takes. If I have to, turn, if I have to be somebody else, if I have to act like somebody else, if, I have to, I have to be, if I'm a Roman and I have to act like I'm a Roman, then I'll act like a Roman. If I'm in, in Italy and I have to act like an Italian, I'll act like an Italian. That's what's going on on that wall right there. You've got a bunch of Americans, they're going over to these foreign countries and they're acting like they are that from that country. They learn the language. They turn. They try to turn into a Hondur, into a Honduran, or they try to turn into a Brazilian. They these brothers. You understand? They're not going over there to be Americans over in Brazil and Italy. They're going over there to be Italians, that they might win the Italians. That's what every one of these brothers on that wall and sisters are doing over there in these foreign countries. And that's what Paul was doing. And that's what we need to look at. Now, this book that I'm using as a study was written in 1936. And in 1936, this is what he said. He said, the lost are not coming to the churches anymore. They're going to other entertainment. This is what he was saying in 1936. He said, we, the lost are not coming into the church. In other words, when the preacher gets up, we know this in here. We're a small church, but we know this. Nine times out of ten, when I get up to preach in here, the church is full of saved people. Now, we know they might not be right with the Lord, but we're saved. Amen. We know where we're going. It's not like it was back in the turn of the late 1800s where Dwight L. Moody would get up. They would come by the thousands. The lost would come by the thousands just to hear Dwight L. Moody preach. It was an event in the whole town. So it's not like that anymore, brothers and sisters. You, you're seeing it. We're not seeing people get saved in this church. What do we do? We've got to take it out to them. That's what this whole study is about, is taking this truth of Jesus Christ to, out to a lost and dying world. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We need to 
take this, the message of Jesus Christ, the gospel, out to a lost and dying world. It's our job. It's not just a pastor's job or a minister's job. It's every Christian's job. Every Christian is a fruit tree in the Lord, and he needs to produce or she needs to produce fruit. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. Let's turn to that. Ephesians 6, 18, if you're following along. So the first thing you need to do to have the proper equipment, carry the proper equipment, carry the correct equipment, is you need to have a prayer list. You need to have a prayer list. Look at verse 18, Ephesians 6, 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. See that capital S? You can pray in your own spirit. But you need to be praying in the Holy Spirit. What do you mean by that? Well, when I pray, say, Lord, will you give me a million dollars? That's praying in my spirit, amen. But when I say, Lord, will you give me a million dollars and I will give 10% of it to the church, I promise to tithe off that, I'm still praying in the spirit, amen. But when I pray and say, Lord, if you'll give me a million dollars, I'll give every one of our missionaries $100,000. Now, now I'm praying in the Holy Spirit. Hope, I hope I am. The truth is, is we need to pray in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance, this is Paul talking, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And I preached on this recently about being an ambassador. Everybody in this room is a Christian, I believe, is an ambassador for Christ. You need to speak boldly for Jesus Christ. What you need to do is be praying about that. Pray, say, Lord, give me the boldness. You say, well, I'm meek. I'm, 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 I'm kind of shy. A lot of us are. Pray for that boldness. Pray for that courage. Pray the Lord will use you. Pray the Lord will, you, will, will work out of you. So you need to pray for, you, for, pray for your own boldness. Pray for the boldness of other Christians in the church. I've said this a hundred times. If you don't like what I'm preaching, pray for me. <laughs> I mean, I could use the prayer. I, if you don't like my preach, say, well, that was a sorry sermon. Say, Lord, he preached a sorry sermon. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. I want something better. Feed me, Lord. That's a great prayer. That's a great prayer to pray. We need to first pray for uh, ourselves, for boldness, pray for the preacher, pray for others to have boldness, and have a list of names of lost people, a prayer list. Now, we just, before we came on here, we were doing a prayer list, and we put some names on there for salvation, amen? You need to keep a list. Here's my advice. Keep it short. Now, I have a long, like if I got my prayer book out, and it's somewhere over here, it's a long list. But what you can do is you can break that list down. You say, Monday, I'm going to pray for this group. Tuesday, I'll pray for this group of people. Wednesday, I'll pray for the, maybe four or five names. And call those names out in prayer. Say, Lord, I pray your, that your Holy Spirit will move on this person. They'll get saved. And call out their names. There's a girl, woman, on our prayer list has been on there for over 15 years. Every Wednesday night. First Wednesday night we had, somebody called her name out. She's been on there for 15 years. I personally went and knocked on her door with another pastor friend, Brother Tut, and... Uh, Try to talk to her about the Lord, and she slammed the door in our face. I don't want to hear that. Slam. So what I do, I stop praying for her. No, I kept on praying. Waiting, waiting. I know another lady. Sent her a letter. Sent her a letter out to her. Talked to her about the Lord. She sent a letter back and called. It was not good. <laughs> Cussed her out over the phone. Cussed her out. You still want to serve the Lord? It's fun. It's exciting. It's fun and exciting. You say, well, I'm kind of bored. Go serve the Lord. You'll find something to do. There was a soul winner I know, uh, or I don't know personally, but I read about the soul winner and what he would do. He was a businessman, and when he'd go into these different uh, businesses, he would talk to people about the Lord. That's an opportunity at work. You know, you've got to be careful how much you do it, but you can do it. I did it today with a guy that I met. But you can just talk to him about the Lord. You don't have to be hammer him over the head. But he talked, and, and every time he went in, he just would bring some. And he he would, he'd talk to him about the Lord. Where the, the last time he went in, he told that guy, the business owner, he says, "Hey man, do you mind if I put you on my prayer list?" And the business owner was like, "No, I guess I don't mind that." And the guy turned around and said, "Okay, well write it down right here. Write your name down right here." He had the guy write his own name on that prayer list. He said that guy's hand was trembling. It didn't take too long that that guy got saved. And that guy that got saved led somebody else to the Lord who ended up winning thousands of people to the Lord. You don't know who you're affecting what you're going to do. But it takes that kind of, that kind of thinking. God, think out of the box. I'm going to give you some, uh, some ideas. But do your own thing, amen? 
I'm just giving you some ideas I've come up with. Or I've heard other preachers tell me or I've learned over the years. I'm not right. It might not be the right way to do it. Come up with something. If you come up with something really ingenious that the Holy Spirit's given you, please come tell me <laughs> so I can have it. Amen? We're all in this together. So let's share our ideas. Keep a prayer list and keep a list of names. I'd keep them short. A list of anyone you might know who is lost. That's why when I called out earlier tonight, I called out, you know, anybody you want to put on the prayer list for, that's lost? I know we put a lot of names on there, but there surely there's somebody you can think of that's lost. Have a pocket New Testament. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Here's another good, here's some good advice. Now, most of us know to have a prayer list. Most of us know to pray, but... The second point is, have a pocket New Testament. Turn to Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. A pocket New Testament. This, is, of course, is the story of the Ethiopian eunuch that's coming back from Jerusalem, and the Lord is going to send Philip down there to talk to him. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he rose and went. Now look, the Lord just pressed on his heart and told him audibly, Hey, go to this desert place. There's nobody down there, amen. It just says, it's a desert, which is desert. Sometimes the Lord will send you in some weird place. Okay, when I was in Pensacola at school, you ever watch the Drawing Men to Christ that Dr. Ruckman did on TV? That was based out of San Antonio. Guy down in Beeville, Texas. And he's the one that got Dr. Ruckman on TV, it got on Direct Net, Dish Network, Direct TV, it was on there where he was Drawing Men to Christ. That man came into our class and he told a story. He's down from Beeville, Texas. He said, one time I was driving along and I had a, I had a flat tire, blew a tire, had to change tire. He said, I literally was, I was fuming, cussing, mad. Finally got to the tire station, sit in the tire station. They said, okay, it'll take 10, 15 minutes. We'll get you a new tire on there. And he said, an hour later, I was sitting there. Two hours later, I was sitting there. Three hours later, and they're not fixing my tire. He said, the whole time I said, I'm getting madder and madder, and I'm fuming. I have places to be. I have places to go. And he said, right about that time, this guy walks in, comes in and sits next to me, and starts talking to me about how he doesn't know God. That brother, uh, I wish I could think of his name. It slipped my mind. That brother down from Beeville, he said, I, I automatically knew what was going on. I knew exactly what was going on. God had made a divine appointment in my life. God had designed all this to happen so that guy that was looking for him would find me, he said, and I could lead him to Jesus Christ. And he said, right there, I led him to Jesus Christ. This brother was crying while he's telling this story. Why was he crying? He said, because you never know how God's working in your life. And here's Philip being told, go off into the desert. Philip's like, there's nothing out there. All right, Lord, and praise the Lord, Philip obeyed, amen. So sometimes the Lord puts stuff into your life, things happen in your life, you have a flat tire, you run into something, something, there's some delay at the grocery store, some delay somewhere. Man, you better keep your eyes and ears open. The Lord might be trying to make a divine appointment to get you set up because the Lord knows he can use you to tell them about Jesus Christ. So Philip goes down like he's commanding. He arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship. So he, see, he was trying to worship God, but not in truth. Was returning, verse 28, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet, which is the Greek way of saying Isaiah. So he's reading the book of Isaiah. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near. And join thyself to this chariot. So see, Philip's there. He sees this. Here comes this Ethiopian. This black man driving a chariot. Looks very important. And Philip's right here. And the chariot's driving by. And the Lord says to him through this Holy Spirit, go near to him. I'm telling you guys, when you start doing this stuff and try, start trying to serve the Lord by witnessing for him, the Lord's going to press on your spirit. Give him a gospel track. Give her a gospel track. Tell him about me. Tell him. Tell him. Talk to him. You'll get this pressing. I can't explain it. It's not an audible voice, but you'll know it. Anybody in here had that experience? Just a couple of hands raised up. Y'all are brave. Yeah, it's hard to explain, but it just happens. Join thyself to this chariot, verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? So he sees that he's reading the book of Isaiah and he said, Hey, do you know what you're reading? 
And he said, that the eunuch said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Amen. That's what happens. You'll be amazed how somebody wants to talk to you about the Bible. Because they have Bible questions and they want somebody to answer them. And you'll be amazed how you'll have the answer when you really don't think you're going to have the answer. Don't be scared. Nobody has all the answers. But you'll be amazed how sometimes people have a, que have a question. They're like, well, I've always wondered this. And the Lord had give you the answer. Maybe in a sermon you heard. Maybe in a, in a radio broadcast you were listening to on Christian radio. That's why it's so important, guys, to stay in the Spirit. Listen to the good stuff. If you're, if you're on YouTube and you're listening to stuff off YouTube, or go to Christian stuff. Look, you know, go to this, this, this good YouTube pro, cross-examine. J. Frank Waller, Warner Wallace, he's got a good channel. He did, did little six, seven-minute long questions that people ask about Christianity. You, you can listen to that. It gives, it gives you some ideas. Well, here's what he is. He wants to know, what does this Bible mean? Verse 32, the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. Let me ask you something. Would y'all be able to answer that question? I think y'all could, amen. Amen. What would you say? What's the answer to everything in the world? It's Jesus. Why did God do this? Well, I don't know what the question is. I don't know what, exactly what the answer is, but the answer is always Jesus. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. Now, y'all know the story. He gets saved. He goes down and gets baptized. He believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But you notice that he had the Bible there. This is what, what he's talking about. He says, carry, have a pocket New Testament on you. This is one I carried around on, from, for, on me for years and years. and A little bit. This is a whole Bible. It's really what you call a soldier's Bible. It's got a little tin plate on it. It's supposed to be put in your pocket. So if somebody shoots you, pow, it'll block a bullet. Many men were saved in war because they gave these out in World War II. They gave, in, in Vietnam, too. They'd give you these Bibles that were, most of them were done by the Gideons, and they had a little metal plate in there, the Lord is my strength and my shield. You'd put it right in here, a bullet would be stopped by this Bible. But I would use this. You know why I stopped using this? Because one day I was at a hospital, and I was talking to somebody about the Lord, and I said, well, let me open up and let me read that to you. I opened up the Bible, and this is what I did. Uh, I realized I'm getting old. And if you can't see this print, it is tiny. That's why there's dust on this thing, because it's been put up for a long time. So what I did is I turned on to something like this. This is just a New Testament. And what this is, it's got pretty good size top. And it's just the New Testament. But you want to carry, carry one around with you. And for years, I would carry something like this. You could carry it in your back pocket, carry it in your front pocket. You ladies could carry it in your purse. It's small enough. But you always want to have it on because you never know when you're going to have an opportunity to open the Bible and to lead somebody to Jesus Christ. Don't you want to have your Bible? Now, this is what I've turned off to using now is this. Is this, is, and, and this is just a zipper. It's a world edition a Bible. It's a King James Bible. It's got bigger print. It's the whole Bible. But it's small. I zip it up so if, if it's raining or something's happening. If I know I'm going soul winning or we're out street preaching or whatever, this is the Bible I use. It's light. I can hold it up for a long time and preach. But I also can put it in the small of my back like this, like a gun. And nobody knows. See, they, see, when I go to knock on the doors, they don't know I'm loaded. And then I can pull it out. Because if you come up with a Bible like this, hey, I want to talk to you about Jesus Christ, they're going to go crazy nut and slam the door on you. Will they do that? Of course they'll do that, amen? You would do that. Paul a Jehovah's Witness. Slam. But when you have a Bible like this, I have a smaller Bible, it helps a lot. Now, this is what I've, and this is my walk with the Lord, what I've turned to doing. Now I've turned to doing this. And all this is good stuff. I mean, all this works. I've turned to doing this. This is the Bible that we hand out. These are free Bibles we have here at the church. Anybody who needs a Bible, anytime, anyplace, this is the Bible I give them. It's a King James Bible, but it's large print. 
Personal size, giant print reference Bible. It's a good Bible, but they're cheaper. We can get them at a reasonable price, so we order them in by the cases. What I recommend everybody in this church do, if you want to be a soul winner, and I hope you all do, or you wouldn't be here on Wednesday nights, grab one of these Bibles. Put one of these Bibles in your car. Always have one of these around. My wife and I, a couple of, maybe a month ago, we gave two of these out in one week. I was at a Goodwill, and the guys in, uh, no, it was at a, kind of a Goodwill store, and the guys in there going, do y'all have any Bibles? And they're like, well, I don't know if I have any Bibles. I've got a Bible. I'll give you a Bible. Oh, do you? And I went out to the car. I had a Bible, and I handed him this Bible. And this Bible, and I always in these Bibles, when I put them in my car, I take one of these gospel tracts and put it in here. Tell them about Jesus Christ. And it's brand new. Why I like to carry these around, and this is what I like to do when I was in a prison ministry, take one of these, you can open it up, and you can try to, when you're leading somebody to Jesus Christ, you can open your Bible, and this is theirs to keep. You can say, okay, uh, I'm going to show you, we were talking about the Romans Road, you're leading them in the Romans Road, you're like, let me show you a couple of verses, you're talking about the Bible, you open your Bible up, and you say, hey, hey this is a, take this Bible, it's yours. Take it home and read it, read the Gospel of John, whatever you want to tell them, but see, it's theirs. And if they get saved, they will want it. Amen. I had a young man I know that got led to the Lord. I was there with him. Guess what he got? This exact Bible right here. Right here. This is the exact Bible I gave him. Now, this isn't the best Bible you can buy, amen. But this will get you started. Everybody keep one of these in your cars. If you've got multiple cars, keep multiple Bibles. We've got plenty of Bibles. But at least have one with you so you can use it. And you never know. Wherever you're at, you might be somewhere you let... You know, I don't carry my Bible around. This thing's too precious to me. I've got a bazillion notes in this thing. As a matter of fact, if you open the front of this Bible right here, it says, if you'll return it to this certain, certain address, it has my phone number, you'll get a reward if you find this Bible. And I will, get, I will pay you kindly. You could ransom me over this Bible right here. Because I've got too many years of notes in here. But you want to use a New Testament. You want to be able to open up a Bible and hand it... And, and, and be able to hand it to them. Here's the, here's the advantage of, of, of carrying a Bible. The advantage of carrying a Bible and, and having a Bible with you is, first off, it puts the authority on the Bible. It takes it off of you. You see what I'm saying? You got to know your Bible a little bit, amen, so you get familiar with it, know where the Romans Road is, but if you say, hey, we're all sinners, and they say, I don't think that's true, you say, well, that's what the Bible says. And you can say, look, can I show you? And what would that verse be? What verse would you use? I'll give you a hint. It's in the Romans Road. What verse would you use? Amen. Somebody called it out. 3.23. Turn to Romans 3.23. You don't have to, but I'll turn to you. And you can turn to Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible don't say that. Well, do you, you mind reading that right there? See, it takes the authority off of you and puts it on the Bible where it needs to go. When a lost soul sees you have a Bible, it tells them that you're serious about what you believe. See, when you have a Bible and you, you're caring about like I said, you don't have to carry around this big old honker of a Bible. Even if it's a small little Bible like this or a little bitty holy Bible like this, when you, when you pull it out, it tells them, hey, this guy's not just fooling around. This isn't just one of those hypocrite Christians that everybody talks about. This guy actually knows. When you pull this thing out, you act like you know what you're talking about. Amen? You might not know what you're talking about. Right? Right? I mean, all right. But you've got something. It gives, it gives you authority. And it's not about you, amen. It's about Jesus Christ from the Bible. Many, many Catholics I've talked to, it goes back to this book right here. Why? A Catholic knows about Jesus. But they're putting their faith in the church, not in the real Jesus. So when you open up a Bible and you start showing them verses about what Jesus said, it doesn't jive with what their priest has told them. It takes the authority away from you, right? Well, the problem's between your priest and this book. Not me. I'm just telling you what the book says. And it gives them, you, you, you're allowing the Holy Spirit to move. It gives you confidence to point to what is written on paper. That's what I like about using my Bible. When I'm witnessing somebody, is when I say, hey, we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. It gives me confidence to be able to say, see, that's what it says. Can you read that? See, read it. 
It gives you confidence. Can you imagine? We're salesmen, amen? We're trying to sell people on Jesus Christ. We all agree with that, amen? Can you imagine somebody coming to your door, knocking on your door and saying, hey, I've got this most amazing vacuum cleaner. It actually runs itself. Vacuums around every corner. You don't have to do anything. It's amazing. It'll suck up 16 pounds of dirt, blah, 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 blah. And you're like, really? That's amazing. But I don't have one here with me. You want to buy one? <laughs> no. Can you imagine that? That's foolishness. If you're trying to sell somebody on Jesus Christ, this is how you're going to sell them. This is your main equipment, brothers and sisters. This is it. That's why I encourage you to read it every day. I encourage you to study it. You're not going to get all you need from just coming Sunday and Wednesday night. You need to get it, you need to get it yourself. If you've got questions about the Lord, I don't know what question it might be. What, let's just, I'm going to throw this out there. Let's say you have a question like this, because I had a man ask me one time a question like this. Like, Where in the Bible does it talk about homosexuality? I had a guy say, I had a man tell me, a grown man tell me, the Bible doesn't speak against homosexuality. Well, guess what? I couldn't actually turn to the verse and show him. I was a young Christian. But you know what I did? I went home that night. And instead of turning on the TV and watching the slop that's on TV, I got out my concordance. I started looking. And this is before the Internet. This is 1994, 93. Before, way before the Internet, I got out my books, my concordance. I studied all night. So the next day, guess what, I, what happened when I came to work? I had the verses to say, Romans chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 18. You know what happened when I showed him the Bible? You know what he did? I guess I was wrong. I guess I was wrong. It's hard to speak against the word, brothers and sisters. It prevents argument. Just like the illustration I give you, it prevents an argument. Whenever you can show somebody the Bible and they say, this is, what, this is the art, this is the illustration, this is what I'm trying to tell you. You're talking to somebody about Jesus Christ. You're trying to talk to them about the Lord. You pull out this book, nine times out of ten, the first thing out of a lost man or woman's mouth is, that book is just written by men. It's full of errors. That's what they're going to tell you. Now, when they say that, this is what I always do. You do what you want to do. This is what I always do. Show me. I've never found one. Will you show me? They've never shown me one. <laughs> Not one. They've always heard that. They just say that. What do you do then? Well, can I show you what the Bible says? Because I've looked. I haven't found one. I mean, I, you're not trying to be rude, right? You're just trying. The point is, Jesus Christ did this through his whole ministry. When they would attack him, you know what he'd do? He would attack them with a question. That's how you do it. When they get you and say, well, that Bible's full of errors. Well, show me. Will you show me one? You don't have to be rude. Amen? You say, well, I really want to know. Do you know where that's at? Because I'd love to talk to you and show you. Maybe we can look at it together and I'll show you. Because sometimes, even if they do show you one, it's amazing what they think is an error. I had, years and years ago, I had this guy arguing with me on the Internet. He was an atheist. He said, the Bible's full of errors. It's just full of problems. and full of errors. And I, on, the, on the Internet, I said, well, show me one. So he Googled up. I know that's what he did. Amen? He Googled up on the Internet and he... he, he, he Messaged me back on this, it was a board, a message board. He messaged me back on the board and said, well, the Bible says that, that a bat is a, it, what, what was it about a bat? Oh, it said a bat is a bird. The Bible says a bat is a bird. But we all know a bat's a mammal. That was, that's why he said the Bible had an error. The bat is a, a bat is a mammal, but the Bible says a bat is a bird. So what do you, how do you answer that? Is a bat a mammal? Anybody go to science class? A bat's a mammal, amen? Does the Bible say a bat's a bird? Yes, it does. What, do you do? what would you do if you went to a court of law? This is what you would do. You go to court of law, you have a jury there, you're sitting there, and the, and the, and the defendant or the prosecutor comes up and says, this man says that, this man says that, a, bird, that a bat is a bird. You know what I'd do if I was his lawyer? I'd say, call up the scientist. The scientist comes up, no, a bat is a mammal. I'd call up somebody else and say, what do you think a bat is? I think a bat's a horse. I think a bat is a peacock. I think a bat is a demon. A mammal's what we're classifying. Man made that up. 
But if you ask any three-year-old kid and you see something flying in the air, say, what is that? They say, that's a bird. Man made up those classifications. It does not count as an error in the Bible. The Bible has got to be judged by itself. You see what, that, what I'm saying? You can't let somebody else make out the parameters. When you say a bat's a mammal, then you're making the parameters. Man decided a bat's a mammal, a whale's a mammal, this, that, and other. It's all man-made. It's not an error, brothers and sisters. My point is, when somebody asks you a question, what you want to do is then say, well, can you show... I heard the Bible says this. Well, can you show me that? Because I've never seen that. I had a young woman one time tell me, the Bible says that all babies go to purgatory. I said, really? She goes, yeah. It's in the Bible? She says, yeah. I said, who told you that? My grandmother? I said, that's in the Bible? She says, yes. I said, where's it at? She goes, well, I don't know. I said, well, it's not in there. She goes, yes, it is. <laughs> so I left my living room, went and got my Bible, came back. This was when I was like 21, 22. Young Christian came back in there and said, show me. Well, well I, don't, I don't know where it's at. Well, then it's not in there. And guess what I found out after I studied? It's not in there. Her granny was wrong. The point is, you want to put the authority on the Bible and then say, well, can I show you something I do know about the Bible? Romans chapter 3. The Bible says that we're all sinners and come short of the glory of God. I do know that. It says it right there. What did Mark Twain say? It's not, the, about, it's not the things about the Bible I don't understand that scare me. It's the things about, about the Bible I do understand that scare me. Nobody understands this Bible completely. It's holy. But the things we do understand, there's a heaven, there's a hell, you're a sinner, you're going to hell without Jesus Christ. Those things I can understand. It's real simple in the Gospel of John. So let's look at one last thing. We've got a couple of minutes. No, let's just close here. I don't, I don't want to go long on you guys. I go long every Wednesday night and wear you guys out. I don't, I don't want to do that. I will save it for next Wednesday, Lord willing. Come on in here next Wednesday, and we will, we will get it going. Because that's about 30-minute study. That's good enough. I know y'all been working all night long. I mean, all day long. Y'all come in here. But, guys, I can't encourage you enough. We got these in the back. Pick these up. Pick you up some of these. We got plenty. And if we run out, that's what we have money for. We'll order some more. We'll get plenty of these in. And, and, and have them in your car. So if you get an opportunity, you can hand somebody out. Even if you don't want to, you don't have to be witnessing to them, amen? You don't have to be like you've been in some long study to say, hey, do you want a Bible? I got one. You want, it's a free Bible. It's brand new. You'd be amazed how many people take you up on the offer. We hand these out, a lot of these out when we were at the, the last festival we were at. We handed out tons of Bibles. Tons of them. And the Gideons were handing out Bibles down there. But see, this is a full Bible. And you'd be amazed how many people want to have a King James Bible. They heard enough and know enough to say, yeah, that's the one my grandmother used or my granddad. That's the one my uncle says is the best. Yeah, I'll take that one. The truth's still out there. Amen? All right. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you, Father, for these people, Lord, that love you and come in here, Lord God, that learn from you, Lord. And I pray, Father, your Holy Spirit was the one that led us and guided us and taught us tonight, Lord God. And Father, I pray, Lord, a special blessing on them, Lord. And I pray, Father, that anybody in here that has the courage to try to follow you, Lord God, and try to lead somebody to you, Lord, that you'll give them the opportunity, uh, fill them with your Holy Spirit, Lord God. But above all else, Lord, just bless them. Uh, give them that joy that only comes from serving you, Lord God. And Father, I pray, Lord, and thank you, Father, for the healing you've been giving Brother Ronnie, Lord. I pray you continue to heal, heal him up, Lord God. And pray will you be with everybody on our prayer list that was called out tonight, Lord God. And Father, I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you for your enduring word that I can stand on its authority and open it up and say, thus saith the Lord. And it's not about me. It's not about my opinion. It's about what you've written, Lord, and what you're putting into this book, Lord. And I thank you for it. In Jesus Christ, holy name I pray. Amen. All right, we'll stop there, yeah.